Hello students, today we will be discussing Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market. Um, as you already know that this is a Victorian poem and we have already completed uh, studying Dover Beach, Ulysses uh, and many such other Victorian poems. Now while discussing those poems, we have uh, kind of understood that Victorian age is all about um, some compromises. You know, on one side we had those uh, crises of faith where people were having unsure thoughts about religion, about science, about new developments. On the other hand, we have these colonial expansions where uh, on one hand you had this industrial revolution giving you an economic security and on the other hand you were facing a crisis where you did not know uh, how art is to be seen. Now from those points of view, uh, what becomes very clear is that Victorian, especially Victorian middle class people, they had this notion that art is to be equated with morality. Uh, art is supposed to teach you something. When you write a poem, uh, you, when you write a story, a novel, when you make a painting, you're supposed to instruct people. You know, you're supposed to give some moral lessons like Ishop's Fables gave us. When we come to Christina Rossetti in Goblin Market, we will see that she is deliberately using sensuous images which appeal to your sense organs. It appeals to your sense of sight, sense of smell, sense of hearing and then this becomes important because she feels that real literature uh, like every other pre-Raphaelite poet thinks is rooted, is based on real life experiences where there is no ground for any teaching, any morality, any ethical codes that a poet should follow. Now apparently this is a very beautiful poem which gives you a story. It's almost in the form of a narrative. Uh, it's like a fairy tale and it has hidden messages. Now what we will do in this class is we will read through the lines and we'll try to understand, uh, first we will understand what the story is about. Then we will try to understand the layers which it contains. Um, so let me just begin with the text. Morning and evening, maids heard the goblins cry. Come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy, apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, plump unpecked cherries, melons and raspberries, bloom down cheek peaches, swat headed mulberries, wild freeborn cranberries, crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather. Morns that pass by, fair eves that fly, come by, come by. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharp palaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries. Taste them and try. Currants and gooseberries, bright fire-like barberries, figs to fill your mouth, citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. So this is the beginning of the poem. What is it about? This is about some goblins were selling fruits. Now what are goblins? Uh, you have done Harry Potter, right? Goblins are, of course, imaginary creatures, uh, magical creatures. You know, if you remember those uh, Green Grots Bank in uh, Harry Potter, where Harry goes to get his money in the beginning of the story, the goblins were those creatures with pointed ears. Okay, remember, right? So, goblins are not something uh, which human beings trust 
naturally because goblins have this uh, you know distance from us they are not fairies and they are not mermaids they are not creatures which we are comfortable with so they are creatures which human beings consider evil different from others from us and they might cause you harm so goblins world is a world which uh, you know the morally correct human being will never go to all right so now these goblins are the fruit sellers fine but what i want to point to you is while i was reading the first paragraph you would have noticed that you know what rosity does she gives you repeated words repeated names of fruits and uh, all those names are so uh, good to hear you know it's like your senses are lulled your ear is satisfied and you can almost taste the beautiful uh, juices of the pomegranates of the different kinds of berries that she mentions now why is she mentioning so many berries what are berries berries are uh, the kinds of fruits which you usually find in the forests they are uh, wild fruits uh, they have a sense of the exotic the mysterious uh, they they are not usually of um, uh, very conventional tastes so what you get here uh, through this series of names of fruits mostly berries you get uh, a, a kind of a bombardment of flavors okay you can almost taste um, the the juices which do not belong to our usual world of experience okay because they belong to the world of the goblins who represent uh, the world beyond your experience all right Evening by evening, among the brookside rushes, Laura bowed her head to hear. Lizzie veiled her blushes. Now, uh, Laura and Lizzie are two sisters who hear the cry of the goblins. What we need to understand is the difference in their reactions. Laura bowed her head to hear. <coughs> Lizzie veiled her blushes. When you bow your head, okay, which it means you are expressing an interest, you are showing curiosity. You know, you you bend down and you bow and you want to listen more. So that is the reaction of Laura. And what is Lizzie's reaction? Lizzie veiled her blushes. So Lizzie is also reacting to the call of the goblins, but she is veiling them. Veil means what? Veil means a parda. It's it's like a curtain a mask which you wear to hide your real emotions so it is not that lizzie is not reacting to the call of the goblins she is reacting but she is deliberately trying to hide what she is actually feeling crouching close together in the cooling weather with clasping arms and cautioning lips with tingling cheeks and fingertips lie close laura said pricking up her golden head so laura is feeling nervous okay she wants to stay close to lizzie uh, to hold on to her because she knows that the cry of the goblins is creating something inside her which she doesn't want to happen we must not look at goblin men we must not buy their fruits who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry thirsty roots now we are often told not to consume things not to eat things uh, about which we do not have any knowledge so here the problem of laura is that she wants to consume those fruits but she is unsure because she doesn't know uh, from which forests these fruits were plucked come by call the goblins hopping down the glen oh cried lizzie laura laura you should not peep at goblin men lizzie covered up her eyes see the consistent reaction in lizzie uh, she is veiling her looks she is she is shutting her eyes 
she is trying to deliberately shut down all her sense organs which are responding to this uh, invitation of the goblin men. Covered, close, lest they should look, Laura reared her glossy head. But we know that Laura is different. Um, she is not... Uh, she is not about to uh, shut herself away. So uh, earlier she had bowed down. Now she is raising her uh, her throat because she wanted to uh, see more about these goblin men. And whispered like the restless brook, Look Lizzie, look Lizzie, down the glen trap little man. One holds a basket. So now she is describing to Lizzie uh, the different goblin men which she can see. One hauls a basket, one bears a plate, one lucks a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the wine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious. How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. So she has started uh, imagining uh, the places from where these goblins have got their fruits. No, said Lizzie. No, no, no. Their offers should not charm us. Their evil gifts would harm us. So see, continuously, uh, Lizzie is trying to stop Laura because she knows that if Laura breaks that boundary, if Laura transgresses that boundary, that, that margin, uh, then she will be beyond uh, the clasp of society which appears to protect them. So she wants to protect Laura from the world of the goblins. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes and run. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. So you see the word curious, curious means when you are interested in something and you notice the word choose. Now uh, when we come to the word choose or choice, uh, we know that it is a word we associate with agency. Agency means when you have the power to act. Okay, uh, so whenever you make a choice, you also make a statement that this is me and this is how I am different from others. So the moment Laura is exercising her choice, you know, it's like um, when, when this word choice uh, is uttered in literature, it has very heavy ethos. What kind of ethos you think about the choice uh, that Milton speaks about? Okay, in Paradise Lost, you think about the choice which Shakespeare speaks about in Macbeth. So, choice is something which determines uh, the course of your life. It is something which is an indicator of your destiny. So, your destiny is rather a consequence of the choices you make. So, Laura is seen to exercise her choice, her agency. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. The goblins were the merchant men uh, and, uh, because they were selling fruits. One had a cat's face, one whisked the tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail. One like a wombat, prowled of chews and furry. One like a rattle, tumble, hurry, scurry. So notice the words that... Uh, Rosity is using to describe the goblins. Um, the words are uh, not human words. Okay, she is not using adjectives we usually use to describe human beings. She is using subhuman, uh, bestial words, as if to say that the goblins belong to a subhuman world. They are, uh, but these are not supernatural words. You see, so the the words themselves uh, belong to a normal, natural order of things. You know, a cat, a rat, a wombat, uh, a snail. These are the things you find in nature. So they are not supernatural. But when you describe a human figure, 
a human like figure with these words they gain a supernatural significance all right so the goblins do not look like humans um, and they have this connection uh, with this world of animals she heard a voice like voice of doves cooing all together they sounded kind and full of loves in the pleasant weather so one one hand we have uh, words like rat cat uh, snail and on the other hand we have a word like dove now usually you associate uh, dove with uh, love peace okay so it's a very beautiful bird and usually we associate it with good things so there is an element of dichotomy uh, there is a peculiar duality in the goblin men uh, because on one hand they are very pleasing all right and on the other hand uh, they are uh, like rats and snails and you don't know uh, you wouldn't call them pleasant in that sense so this is what temptation is about okay if something is going to tempt you that should be very pleasant isn't it uh, you will not be attracted to something uh, which looks uh, bad and sounds bad which doesn't have an element of attraction to it so these goblin men they have a peculiar duality in them on one hand you feel a kind of a revulsion you feel that you don't want to be with them and on the other hand they pull you towards them Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush embedded swan like a lily from the beck like a moonlit poplar branch like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone no the word restraint restraint means something which holds you back right so laura is behaving as if her restraint is gone something which holds her back that uh, that chain that restrain is no more and she lunges forward okay like an arrow uh, which leaves uh, when it's left backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men with their shrill repeated cry come by come by so laura goes towards the goblin men the goblin men were selling the fruits with their usual uh, cry when they reached where laura was they stood stock still upon the moss leering at each other so when they came and saw laura they stood on the spot and they looked at each other in a and they started to leer at each other leering is when you have this wicked mischievous smile you know that that kind of was but look we have got a victim now and uh, okay let's get hold of her so that's the kind of an expression you might find uh, on a salesman's face when he finally finds a possible customer whom he can sell uh, his products so that kind of a smile okay it's a knowing smile uh, which uh, which shows that uh, the goblins they were very excited to find laura but they did not want to show their excitement totally brother with queer brother signaling each other now this word queer uh, the word queer originally meant uh, something peculiar something unnatural but during the end of the 19th century this particular word started to mean something else too now it started to be associated with um homosexual or same sex desires okay so a queer brother means when um when two two men have a sexual relationship so it is considered to be unnatural it is considered to be um not following the codes of nature according to conservative society so here the goblins are not just bestial but they are also queer all right so con constantly the goblins are presented as something um, which the human society will never sanction okay 
So let's come back to the story. Laura was standing there. The goblins had come. They started to smile at each other mischievously. And they wanted to make her a possible customer. Brother with sly brother. One set his basket down. One reared his plate. One began to weave a crown of tendrils, leaves and rough nuts brown. Men sell not such in any town. See again. The world of the goblins is different from the world of men. Their, their, their merchandise, the, the things which they are selling are different from the things which men sell. So Rosetti is uh, always pointing out that goblins belong to the other world. All right. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by, was still their cry. Laura stared but did not stir. Longed but had no money. Longed means she had this desire to consume that fruit but she had uh, no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. So uh, they, they offered her their fruits. Uh, the cat-faced purred, the rat face spoke a word of welcome, and the snail paced even was heard. One parrot-voiced and jolly cried, pretty goblin, still for pretty Polly, one whistled like a bird. So all these different goblins, they were, uh, they were targeting Laura, they were trying to sell their fruits to Laura. But sweet tooth Laura spoke in haste, good folk, I have no coin to take. Went to purloin. So purloin means to steal something, to take something which doesn't belong to you. So Laura is uh, described as sweet tooth. Sweet tooth is a very soft word for a greedy person. A person who loves uh, sweet dish. And when you associate women with, um, with this kind of an adjective, it has negative connotations because society wants women to be, you know, all sacrificing. You're not supposed to want special kinds of fruits and special kinds of food items. So there is a, 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 it's a judgmental society uh, which doesn't approve of women being sweet tooth. Laura thinks that if she is buying the fruits without uh, any money, it's like stealing. So she has her morality in place. I have no copper in my purse. I have no silver either. And all my gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. So uh, the money which she might get in future is in the furs which she will cut and sell and get the money. But it's like it's not something which she has now. So it also directs us at the... Uh, the lack of uh, enough money to buy things which you desire. All right. You have much gold upon your head. They answered all together. So gold means here are golden locks. Um, so from a monetary transaction, a transaction which involves money, it is turning into uh, something which involves her body okay so her lock of hair which is a part of her woman's body is considered to be uh, a medium of transaction almost like a currency all right so the concept of a woman selling her body is a very very strong concept and you have a hint at that here. It's almost as if Laura is acting like a prostitute that in, in, in exchange of her body, okay, in exchange of um, something which belongs to her physically, she is gaining an advantage. She is gaining a favor. All right. You have much gold upon your head. They answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl. Now you have already 
you are familiar with uh, the rape of the lock and you see how the lock of hair is often uh, associated with feminine order so the moment laura clips her hair her lock of hair she is making a bargain she is making a statement that okay you take my lock of hair and you give your fruits so she is putting her honor at stake here okay she clipped a precious golden lock she dropped a tear more rare than pearl then sucked their fruit globes fair or red sweeter than honey from the rock stronger than man rejoicing wine clearer than water flowed that juice she never tasted such before how should it cloy with length of use she sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchard bore she sucked until her lips were sore then flung the emptied rinds away so look at the the ecstasy the excitement that laura is feeling when she is consuming those fruits okay and uh, and the words which are there like uh, you know sweeter than honey you know, stronger than wine so she felt absolutely um, enthralled by the taste and she wanted and wanted to consume more and more of that fruit and she did not even care that while sucking her lips were getting sore tired exhausted okay she went on uh, sucking on them and then she threw the rinds away rinds are the uh, the skins or, and the and the parts of the fruits which you don't eat so so three she threw them away but gathered up one kernel stone so she took back with her one stone stone you know seed of a plant uh, of a fruit so she carried one stone with her and knew not was it night or day as she turned home alone so it was an experience which she enjoyed all on her own and while it was uh, some time between night and day uh, she was not aware of what time it was she returns home and when she returns home she encounters her sister lizzy so obviously lizzy is totally uh, pissed off at her she is totally disturbed by the thought that laura was outside uh, for such a long time lizzy met her at the gate full of wise upbraidings upbraidings means when you scold somebody in a disapproving way that okay you have done something wrong that kind of a scolding so lizzy uh, was full of upbraidings and what did lizzy say dear you should not stay so late twilight is not good for maidens should not loiter in the glen in the haunts of goblin men do you not remember jeeny how she met them in the moonlight took their gifts both choice and many so first lizzy starts with general admonitions that okay why did you spend so much time outside uh, women are not safe uh, you know after dark this is not just lizzy's word this is what the society has always tried to impose upon uh, women that it is not safe for women to loiter about in the dark even now when in this is uh, 21st century uh, when a woman finds herself alone in a dark place after sunset uh, in an unfamiliar place she will feel apprehensive she will feel nervous because society demands you to feel that way society wants you to feel insecure so that the society can tell you that okay i am there to protect you you have to follow my rules all right so first lizzy starts with that this is not something women should do maidens should do then she goes on to tell laura about a girl called jeeni do you not remember jeeni how she met them in the moonlight so we gather that jeeni was a girl who went out and met the goblin men took their gifts both choice and many ate their fruits and wore their flowers pluck from bars with summer ripens at all hours so jinni had enjoyed with the goblin men 
and had consumed their fruits, but ever in the noon light she pined and pined away. But when she came back, Ginny started to suffer and suffered through a terrible phase of depression where she pined. Pined means when you suffer, your health goes away from you, uh, you, you approach death, all right, and every vitality is gone and you are sick to the core. That is pining. She pined and pined away, sought them by night and day. Sought means it's a past tense of seek. Uh, sought means here she looked for the goblins. She wanted, she searched everywhere for the goblins. Sought them by night and day, found them no more. So you see the goblins, they believe that a customer, a client, a woman client uh, is important to them only for the first time. It is almost as if uh, they are obsessed with the concept of virginity. Once you taste their fruit, they lose interest in you as a client. So usually what happens, usually when you have money, you want to buy something, you are in charge. You go to a shop, you buy something. It depends on your choice what you are going to buy. But in case of goblin market, it is not in your hands. Whether they will accept you as customers or not. So when you go there, you encounter them for the first time, they are full of welcome. But the moment they have their experience of your soul, you are of no importance to them anymore. Found them no more, but dwindled and grew grey, then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow where she lies low. So. Jeannie was buried in a grave but when, when, when a person is, dies and is buried you find a bed of grass growing on it or occasionally um, wild flowers that bloom on graves. But in Jeannie's case, Laura, uh, Lizzie says that no grass grows there. So it is as if she is judged even by nature beyond her death. So it is not that the associating yourself with the goblins will uh, will have an impact while you live. It will also have an impact after your death. It is as if nature will reject you. Nature which assimilates human bodies after they die, that nature will reject uh, the human being because it has associated itself with something which is subhuman, something which is not natural. So that will be the sad fate of anybody joining hands with the goblins. I planted daisies there a year ago that never blow, you should not loiter so. Nay hush, said Laura. Nay hush, my sister. So Laura tries to stop Lizzie uh, from uh, saying this and she wants to share her experience. Okay, look, at, look at her excitement. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth waters still. Tomorrow night I will buy more. So that longing, uh, it, it is almost like a drug addiction. Okay, you consume and you want more. It is something which does not, uh, does not bring any satisfaction uh, because you yearn for more of the same experience right and kissed her have done with sorrow I'll bring you plums tomorrow so this is the tendency uh, when you experience something which your sister has not which your friend has not then you want that person to feel the same experience this was something which Eve felt when she offered Adam that fruit this is the feeling that if you bring the other person within that fold of temptation, you get the moral support uh, and you don't feel lonely anymore. Because we know that tragedies uh, are all about alienation, being alone. So Laura wants Lizzie to be a part of this experience because she wants Lizzie as a team. All right. I'll bring you plums tomorrow, fresh on their mother twigs. Cherry is worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in. 
What melons I see cold piled on a dish of gold too huge for me to hold. What peaches with a velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed. So pellucid means translucent, you know the grapes which are almost transparent, you can see through them, there are no seeds in them. Odorous indeed must be the meat whereon they grow. So she is thinking about the meadow. She is thinking about the wonderful place where these fruits had grown. And pure the wave they drink with lilies at the brink. And sugar sweet their sap. So uh, she is not listening to what Lizzie has to say. Because the soul experience... Uh, it still has still uh, continued to overwhelm her and all she can think about is how she can be a part of that experience again so it doesn't matter to her whether um, whether she is unaware of the origin of those fruits uh, doesn't matter to her whether genie's graves grave had any grass or not nothing matters to her so this this complete uh, isolation of the soul this complete self-centered experience where she is negating everything else all right and she wants to pull her sister into that fold so this is a peculiar kind of experience that Laura is going through and she wants Lizzie to be a part of now we will see what happens to her um, after uh, the day and we will see how uh, she, whether she at all becomes like Ginny, uh, how she faces any different fate and what causes that difference of fate in our next class. So uh, we'll stop now and I hope you have enjoyed the poem. Go to the lines again and try to uh, see which words talk about restrictions, about rules, about normality, okay, uh, so that when later in the third class we will talk about the general themes, uh, you will be um, comfortable in understanding uh, how those themes emerge from the words given in the poem itself, okay. So I hope to see you all again when we will have the second part of this lecture. Thank you so much.